black markets, and what country today has the biggest black market? I guess North Korea has a big, a big black market uh, these days. I don't really know any others. Most of the countries I go to now don't have black markets, and I'm not sure what that means, Perry Ann. But you're exactly right. You know, a black market. You see, there's a big premium in the currency. It, it tells you something's wrong. You don't know what's wrong, but you know something's wrong. It's like taking your temperature. You know you're sick if you have a high fever, but you don't know exactly what it is. But it's a good question. I, I don't really know of any of. Uh, black market premiums right now. I have to start uh, trying to go some places that have the premium. Well, I was thinking mostly of Cyprus and what they've been through the past several months. I'm sure there's a huge uh, black market premium in Cyprus. I just haven't been there in a while. Maybe we should have a program from Cyprus. That's a great idea. Well, you also talk about agriculture, and you've spoken out a lot about how until it's profitable to grow food that we're not going to see today's farmers be replaced is obviously a huge problem. So you know, when do you see food prices on a global scale start to increase, and what do you think that we should do now to start to mitigate shortages? It's starting to happen now, Perry Ann. Go to the supermarket or go to a restaurant and you'll see that prices are starting to go up for food. Uh, we've got to do something now. I mean, that farmers around the world are dying and retiring. More people in America, for instance, carry on study public relations than study agriculture. We don't have any young people becoming, uh, most young people are not becoming farmers. So these prices have to go up now, starting now, and they have to go up a good bit. But we're not going to attract any capital, labor, and management into agriculture. And then we won't have any food at any price. The world's got a serious crisis facing it in the next decade or so. This is not the next century. This is the next decade or so. I want to talk to another industry, uh, turning to gold. And now, you did correctly forecast the recent downturn in gold. 12 years up, it's a pretty good run. Uh, how long does a typical correction last in a secular trend? And how patient might gold bulls have to be? Well, normal corrections in stocks, bonds, anything, commodities, last a few weeks or a few months. Unfortunately, gold has been up 12 years in a row, and that's an anomaly. That's not the way markets work. So I suspect this correction in gold will have to last longer just to make up for the great period of the great 12 years. I don't know. Uh, I'm not smart enough to really know, uh, Perry Ann. You should probably watch Prime Interest to get a better answer. Uh, I would suspect it's going to go on for a few uh, weeks, months, uh, maybe even a year or two. But then it's going to set a, set a firm bottom and off we go again at the bull market. Well, allegations of manipulation in the paper, gold and silver markets are legendary in financial circles. And some of the conspiracy theorists have been completely vindicated in recent years. I know you're a long-term investor, but does this play into your decision making in, in the gold markets? No, I'm very skeptical. I've been hearing those stories in gold and silver for at least 30 years, Perry Ann. Uh, I, I'm, <laughs> they're not accurate if you ask me. If, if people are worried about the price of gold, they should look at India. India, India is the largest consumer of gold in the world, and Indian politicians consistently and repeatedly this year have been bringing out measures to limit the purchases of gold, and they say they're going to do more. <laughs> now, when the largest purchaser of anything uh, starts cutting back on demand, it has an effect. There's nothing conspiracy about it. It's what's going on in the world. People should, should watch prime interest or read the papers or watch what's happening in India. That's the largest customer and Indian politics. They're wrong, by the way. They're wrong, but they're looking for a scapegoat. Politicians always look for a scapegoat. You will see more problems coming out of India, and therefore it will affect gold. Forget that. I mean, you don't have to forget the conspiracy theories, but I ignore them. Well, Deutsche Bank is moving $9 billion worth of gold to Singapore. The nations, they already have a reputation for respect of private property and secrecy. You know, banks, for instance, don't have to report and count holders' names to authority. Is Singapore becoming the new Switzerland? Oh, Singapore has already attracted staggering amounts of money from, from, uh, from Europe, partly because the Swiss have had such a monopoly, you know, they've gotten corroded, they've gotten not very efficient, they've gotten expensive, they've gotten not very competent, the results are not great. So there are many, many, many reasons that money is leaving uh, Switzerland, people have been looking for, and, and Europe, people have been looking for a competitor, and Singapore 
is turning out to be a great competitor. Whether it's the new the new Switzerland or not, I don't know. I would suspect it will be, but uh, but but who knows? You can ask me in 20 years. Well, I moved to Singapore. I moved to Singapore not for that reason. It has nothing to do with why I'm here. But that is something that I noticed here in Singapore. Is it possible that Singapore will buckle under pressure from states like the U.S. and eventually turn over customer records as Switzerland's doing? Oh, oh if, if Singapore feels that you, there's a reason to turn over the records, they will turn them over. This is not some kind of ironclad lockbox of secrecy. They, they will turn them over if, if you can present a good reason. Okay, and this wouldn't be prime interest if we didn't take some time to talk about the Federal Reserve. There's been a lot of ch chatter from Fed officials feeling out that the markets uh, might possible, possibly see a reigning end of QE, the so-called tapering, possibly as soon as the end of this year. How realistic do you think this timetable is? Well, I, whether the Federal Reserve reigns it in or the market forces them to, it's going to end. Now, Dr. Bernanke says it's going to last until 2015, but Mr. Bernanke doesn't know much about markets. He doesn't know much about currencies or interest rates or finance, so don't pay too much attention to him. He has never, ever been right about any of his public pronouncements. The market is not going to let this last. You see what's happening in, in Japan. I mean, the whole market's collapsing because people suddenly realize, wait a minute, this cannot go on forever. In Europe, England, U.S., People now realize this is totally artificial, it's not going to last, and whether it ends this year or next year, it's going to end because the market's not going to let it happen. Now, hopefully, it would be wonderful if the central banks around the world got their act together and stopped it because it's not good for the world. But even if they're not smart enough, the market will force them to eventually. After the break, we'll continue our interview with Jim Rogers, getting his take on the Far East. Then Bob English and I have a tasty menu of Fed policy tapering tapas you don't want to miss out on. I would rather ask questions to people in positions of power instead of speaking on their behalf. And that's why you can find my show, Larry King Now, right here on RT. Question more. A new alert animation it scared me a little bit. There is breaking news tonight. In we are continuing to follow the breaking news. Alexander's family crying, tears of joy, and embracing each other that justice has been rendered in a court of law. Found Alive is a story made for the movies, playing out in real life. And welcome back to Prime Interest. Continuing our conversation with Jim Rogers, we were just discussing Chairman Bernanke's decision to skip this year's Jackson Hole meeting, something that's unusual for a sitting Fed chairman. I asked him if he thinks this signaled Bernanke is on his way out next January and won't seek a third term. Well, if I were Mr. Bernanke, I'd try to stay away too if I'd been as wrong as he has been over the past decade. Uh, I suspect it does mean he's not going to try to stay around. If you were Dr. Bernanke, wouldn't you get out too? I mean, the results of this, when, when, when the reality sinks in in the next couple of years, are going to be terrible. The world's going to have huge problems. And it, if I were Dr. Bernanke, I wouldn't want to be around either. I want to leave it to somebody else and blame it on them. But it's his, it's his problem. He's the one who's, who's caused this job. If anybody, he and Dr. Greenspan are the two culprits that have really messed up the world in the last decade. 
if I were Bernanke, I'd try to get out too. Well, let's go back to Japan, who has embarked on the most aggressive monetary and fiscal stimulus program in their history, so-called Abenomics. Initially, the yen weakened considerably, over 25% against the U.S. dollar, and the Japanese stock market went up. But there's been incredible volatility in their bond markets, and now the Nikkei has given up significant gains. You know, what's going to happen next over there? <laughs> That's an extremely good question, Perry. If I was smart enough to know that, I'd be rich, wouldn't I? If it's that easy. Uh, Dr. B I mean, Mr. Abe has said that he's going to print unlimited, that's his word, unlimited amounts of money until he can make Japan some kind of shining star of inflation. Now, Japan has got serious problems. They've got huge debt. They've got a declining population. This, I suspect when we look back in 20 years, this will be, you know, the end of Japan and everybody will lay it at Mr. Abe's feet. The base in your currency is, is something that sometimes works in the short term, but in the long term, it's always ruined economies. It's always, always ruined the countries. France tried it, Italy tried it, Greece tried it, many people have tried it for decades. It has never led to good things. And so Mr. Abe is ruining, ruining Japan. What's going to happen in the short term, I don't have a clue. Uh, I don't own any Japanese shares. I, I've sold all my Japanese shares. I own a little bit of yen. Just because it, it went down so much, I'm hoping it's going to rally. But I don't have much confidence in Japan at all in the present course. It's too bad. It's a wonderful country. It was, anyway. Well, I know it's very difficult to time these types of things. And you said you're not the world's best market timer. But do you think that Japanese will have a crisis before the U.S. or even Europe? Uh, Terry, I want to correct you. I'm the world's worst market timer is what, is what I, I have said. And I am. Uh, that's a very good question. Well, Japan, I would suspect, uh, yeah, I would suspect that certainly Japan will have a crisis before Europe does. <coughs> Europe has already had its ongoing crisis, so we all know about that. The surprise, the next surprise will probably come out of Japan after the election this summer. You know, the upper house of parliament in Japan has an election this summer. I suspect we will start seeing serious problems after the election. Before the, you know, when there's an election, everybody tr tries to hold everything together for the election. After the election, I would suspect there would be problems. And certainly after the German election in the fall, because by then, you know, things are going to start coming apart in many parts of the world. Yeah, excuse me, you said you're not the world's best market timer. Uh, but you also noted the slowdown in the Chinese economy and how uh, this has depressed commodity prices. But you're also on record as being bullish on China and their currency, the renminbi in particular. So when, wh what do you see as the middle ground here? I mean, how bad could things get in China? And what would need to happen to finally see them depeg from the U.S. dollar? Well, you know, if I were China, I would do it by 2010 or 2011 or 2012. Just shows you how much I know uh, about when they're going to depeg. The Chinese have no reason not to make their currency convertible now. I'm not Chinese, so obviously they're going to do what they want to. Uh, I, I would expect it to come any time. Now, they've been making more and more strides towards opening it up in recent months. I mean, they've been opening it since 2005, and in recent 2013, they've certainly made a lot of progress towards making it open and convertible. It could come any time, uh, probably in the next two or three years, it's the pace they're going. Uh, the Chinese have slowed down their economy for good reasons. They have inflation, they have a property bubble, and they said we're going to do something about it. It seems that they are doing something about it, and as you know, their customers, America, Europe, Japan, have slowed down, so it's not a surprise to me. All you got to do is, is watch prime interest to read the newspapers, and you would know that there's a slowdown in China. Uh, uh, Perian, why can't China have a recession? I mean, in the 19th century, as America was rising, we had 15 depressions with a D, and yet we did a pretty good job in the 20th century. So China can certainly have slowdowns. The idea that China cannot have a recession is poppycock. And that was my interview with Jim.